What's up, everyone? Welcome to the North Leeds Jits podcast, the other show. As always, Professor Mike. What's up? And today we're joined by Sarah Brown, who is the new addition to the team. Um, so, do you want to go ahead with the, kind of the story of Mike, or do you want me to? Uh, yeah, go for it. You know. All right. So origi- originally, uh, we did a podcast. I can't remember what number it was. With Andy, um, introduced him as the program director, but unfortunately, uh, kind of everything kind of happened with that, and Andy can't do it. But then we looked um, to get someone else. Ideally, we wanted someone from within the academy still, and it turned out Sarah became available kind of later on, right? Yeah. Um, which I didn't really understand that and what you kind of do before. Not that we've talked in depth about that, so it'll be interesting to hear about that. Um, yeah. as well today um there's a slightly longer backstory if we're being like completely transparent which we probably should because that's integrity is one of our values right that when sarah came in for a first class i don't know if you remember this but there was sarah soaps who currently works for us looking after the care side of the business and making sure everyone's looked after um and then there was another sarah and i said to you i said man those two, if we could get them in the business, like they are going to be perfect. Because we definitely wanted to even up the masculinity of, of what we do. And from a program director role, I really was keen on, obviously someone who's great with people, but kind of changing the perception of what people expect when they walk into a Jiu-Jitsu Academy. So they don't expect, how tall are you, Sarah? Five? Five foot at a push. No. <laughs> they don't expect a five foot woman to be meeting them and saying, oh, welcome for your trial class. They're probably expecting some dude with cauliflower ears and taped up fingers. So I was really keen. And I'd said to you on that first class, like, what do you do for a job? Yeah. And what did you do for a job? That was the question. What were you doing before? I was doing, uh, working in a school, doing child protection. So covering 10 different high schools in the whole northwest of Leeds. Um, so yeah, doing like, yeah, child protection, social care type stuff. And then running my own business alongside it. So Amazing. doing nutritional therapy as well. So yeah. okay, what did you, you went to, I saw in your socials, you kind of went to uni again recently, was it? Yes, yeah, so I went, I think I started in 2018. Right. Um. So yeah, mature student. But to do? Nutritional therapy. Right, so that's yeah. your other business. Yeah, yeah, so that's awesome. what that is. We'll get into that later on because I want to talk about that a little bit and understand a bit more about what you know. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> So where are you from? Are you from Leeds? I am from Leeds, yeah. Well, I was born in Dewsbury Hospital and then uh, grew up South Leeds, so Tingley Way, which is borderline Wakefield. It's got Wakefield postcode, but Leeds phone number actually where Mrs. Bates also grew up. My wife, yeah. shout out to Mrs. Professor Mike. She was born, <laughs> she was born in, Ju- is that what you refer to her as, Mrs. Professor? Mrs. Professor. <laughs> Professor, Professoress. She was born in Dewsbury Hospital, yeah. lived in Tingley. Went to the same high school? Did you know her no, she was a few years above me, so we know mutual people from brief discussions that we've had, and she only lived around the corner as well, actually. It's quite oh, a right. small world, there. They're, they're both upgraded to North Leeds. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> social, social <laughs> mobility, right, yeah. Were you a sporty kid growing up? I'm not sure, actually. At high school, probably, yeah. I was good at long-distance running, really enjoyed doing all, like, sports stuff but never when I was younger I didn't go to any like kids clubs or anything like that didn't really what was your kind of interests back then when I was a kid yeah yeah. hang around on the streets street corners yeah cider cider and ten lambas (laughs) mad dog 2020 (laughs) yeah no um just never really went to anything when I was younger my my, my mum and my dad wasn't really kind of that type of family my mum was always out working really long hours my dad the same, he was an engineer, and then when they divorced when I was 11, then I went to live with my mum, and again, she was just working like three jobs, so I didn't really have anyone to, no. didn't have the opportunity, I guess, yeah. Did you have any siblings? Um, only once I became an adult, so I'm old enough to be both of my sister's mums. Oh, right. So one of my sisters is 19, and then my other sister, she's 17 in December. Oh. So I've never lived with them because I moved out at yeah. 16. 
Um, and what did you want to, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to work with people who committed crime, uh, which is what I did end up doing eventually. Um, oh, but that cool. was, I think because of where I grew up, there was a lot of people, even my friends who were getting into trouble and I was always not quite, you. not me, oh, no, no, no. Did you fancy the police then? You didn't, Never fancied you the police. No, but I also think at the age I was and maybe a bit of the upbringing I had and not kind of that encouragement, I also didn't think anything like that was a possibility mm. or an option. Um, so yeah, and then because I moved out at 16 and just started working full time. And then when I got into my mid twenties, I started to volunteer at the Youth Offending Service, did that for a bit. And then that was my into then working with, uh, I guess, disadvantaged families, people who committed crime. All right. So, was that quite a rewarding? I mean, it sounds kind of stressful. It was very rewarding. Mm -hmm. It was difficult. And I always remember getting into quite a lot of arguments with people over the views on maybe people who committed crime and didn't always understand maybe the backstory and um quick to judge aren't we yeah very quick to judge yeah and i guess i saw both sides because i would get the crown prosecution papers and see what offense they'd committed but then when you get to meet them and you understand kind of their life and what they've gone through not that i'm condoning what they do in any way but they're also victims of things themselves and often they just needed a little bit of love so it was rewarding, but really challenging as well. So I did that for about 10 years. Mm. Um, I think the difficulty in that job was seeing what they then continued to face throughout their lives and then being that support network for them and trying to give them all this love and care. And then if they didn't turn up to a few appointments, you had to send them back to court. So I, my job mm. was to keep them out of prison, but equally, I not that it was my fault they'd not turned up, but I'm then the one who... Were you a bit like a parole officer then? Yes, it's like probation, but oh, for okay. age 10 to 18. Roger. Um, yeah, yeah. But sometimes we would keep some of the older ones because if they're kind of, what's the word I'm looking for? Their understanding age might be much lower. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they might be functioning like a 10 year old. Something I've, uh, we spoke about um, in one of our early podcasts, something I'm really keen to try and get to, to happen in this place at some point in the next, I don't know, short amount of time. Is to have some outreach program for jujitsu for disadvantaged children because be great. you know particularly the kids that are hanging around scrapping you know doing crime and being gangsters like you want to you want to come in here and you know let's learn how to fight properly or learn how to defend yourself and learn how not to fight yeah you know uh, another I school do that. I just worked at they were really keen actually yeah, yeah, yeah. on that I'd contact the breeze them. program we need to get back into it I'll sort that out that's my job yeah. for me to do that'd be a really good idea so. Initially, did you? How did you get into that field of, of the, the helping the kids again? Volunteering. So you went volunteering, and then through that you got into the support work. Yeah, right. yeah. So I was a uh, working full time as a mortgage advisor at the time, mm -hmm. um, and then managed to adjust my hours so I could still do full time hours in three days, but then commit to volunteering twice right. a week. Wow. Um, and then a job came up six months in. I was lucky enough to get it. So. Amazing. So yeah. then, was that was that what were you doing all the way up? Because you got going to the schools, right? Yeah. How did that happen? So um, there was a big bit in between there. There's a big bit in between oh, there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. so I probably did that for almost ten years, and then uh, in about two thousand and ten, when I got married, my husband and I got into rock climbing, got massively addicted. Our honeymoon ended up being three weeks rock climbing in Thailand, just climbed every day, and then came home and we were like, oh, we want to do this for a really long time. Like really, really got the bug, kind of liked the lifestyle that came with climbing, really simple, meeting nice like-minded people, just being outside all day. So we decided to go traveling and just go climbing everywhere around the world. So saved up hardcore for like three years, then went on a sabbatical from the Youth Offending Service for a year, went traveling all around Asia, rock climbing everywhere, came back for about three or four months, quit our jobs and then went again. Just then, like real like dirtbag style, like living in the back of vans on people's floors, wild camping, hitchhiking. Just, good. yeah, it was amazing. Great experience. So good, yeah. And you were out, out there for three years? Yeah. Yeah, three years almost. And we were chatting yesterday because we had Gwyn, shout out to Gwyn Jones, <laughs> a friend of mine who's going to do some um, some work with us. But he, he was asking the same kind of questions and you were, you pretty, I was like, you've been to pretty much every country and climbed, like pretty much every continent at least. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, so, What's the story you tell most often from your 
trouble in, in climbing? I don't even know. I thought it was kind of scorpion bite while you were yeah. like just clipping into a caribou. <laughs> well, I know lots of people that got bitten by rattlesnakes and we were in Mexico or got bitten by bats. Oh, Often wow. you'd put your, your hands in, so it's like the limestone, obviously loads of different creatures living yeah. there. And yeah, sometimes you'd like be like that, putting your hand in. And I do remember one time we were climbing in Borneo and uh, there was no other real climbers around. We were staying in this little village that had a chief and we got to meet the chief in the village and that's why wow. it was the most like coolest thing to do. And he pulled fruit from his trees and his garden and it just felt felt really special, mm. like really privileged to do it. But not far from there, there was a, a climbing area. And then I don't know if you see them, but climbers sometimes wear glasses. They're like a little prism, so you don't have to look up and hurt your neck all the time. And I remember um, it's called B Lane, you know, we yeah. know the bottom B Lane, and uh, just B Lane Jason and all these spiders like jumping off. And then I had to go up and um, like do all the rope technical stuff at the top. And right on the last hold was like a spider bigger than my hand. And we didn't know if any of them were poisonous yet because we'd not met any of the locals. And yet, just had to go for it, but because oh I guess if I do, then I've got just to hold on to the spider's <laughs> leg. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I can't think of any crazy stories right now. What a great experience, it will have though. Been, I mean, I got told off for hitchhiking without Jason one time when I was in Mexico. That oh, was a uh, yeah, not good with these Mexican cowboy. We it wasn't just me on my own, but I think I don't know. You just yeah, maybe become wow. a bit too. Uh, what's the word? Free. Yeah. Yeah. What was, yeah do you have a, a favourite place you went to? Or a favourite place to climb? I mean, the best place to climb was Spain. It's like the rock climbing mecca of the world. It's just amazing. Do you climb just outside Barcelona? Yeah, yeah, I did a lot outside Barcelona. So in the middle of all our trip, we went to, we pretty much lived in Spain for like a year, stayed with a family for around six months near Valencia. And it was kind of really well connected to loads of climbing areas. And when it got too hot, then we started moving up and drove all the way around. So we went climbing around nice. nearby. How do you find all these people like to just like move into? Um, work away. So just the community? Or is, yeah, or is there's like work a... away is a really good website. And oh, I was okay. really like picky on where I selected. I made sure when I found out where they lived, like Googled, is there any climbing near this area? Mm. Like check that the climbing was good. Um, yeah. And then sometimes some of it was word of mouth. So they'd be like, Oh, I've got a friend who lives just out by Salona. It's like a big communal place. We're all around bed. Go stay with them. And then, yeah, just kind of got wow. passed around. So That's it was really cool. cool. Yeah, I went to Barcelona on a climbing trip once. Did like, you? I went to, you know, Chris Sharma's gym. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And there for a while. That was cool. Did you meet him? I didn't. I met his photographer who, like, looks incredibly like him, which is really <laughs> weird. <laughs> yeah. They do look really yeah, alike, yeah. don't they? I think it's like the Spanish climber look. Right. Yeah. 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 It is, yeah. <laughs> Where did you go climbing? Uh, I don't even remember the names now, but it was, we kind of went on a few, like, day trips out. Is it, like, Margalef from... or Serrano? I can't, I can't remember. remember. It was kind of like they, they ran it. We were just kind of stayed nearby and we'd yeah. climb like in the gym and then they'd run day trips and stuff like that. Did they take you deep water solo in? Uh, yeah, yeah, so I went, went yeah. to do some, some, some like lead climbing and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. nice. That's cool. Um, but yeah, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we could talk yeah. climbing, yeah. yeah. And did, did you, just to finish on that then, so oh, yeah, were you yeah. always going to be away or like, was it like we're going to do three years and we're going to come back or we're like, well, let's just fucking do this forever? Or? Yeah, no, we were meant to do it forever, yeah, wow. so... Um, when we were in Spain, a friend who we'd met in China messaged and he lives in America in Colorado and said, right, I'm buying a van. Do you want to come over? I'm going to drive all the way down to Patagonia. We'll just see how long it takes us. So that was the plan. So went over to America, climbed there for three months, then drove into Mexico, stayed there for a couple of months, but came home because my dad died. Um, and then, yeah, just been back since. And then that's how I started to get in, into schools. Right. Um, do, do you miss that? feeling of freedom or because I imagine if you've spent that amount of time doing it you, you kind of know how to do it and you, you know what it feels like and then the mundanity perhaps of kind of the rat run the hamster wheel of life like do you do you miss that does it draw you back yeah I do miss it actually and I always I kind of wanted to bring some of the I guess that type of lifestyle into living when we came back here but it's just so hard to live like that simple life and mm. not get like, I still haven't got a TV, refused to get a TV really? yet. Well, that's that's one cool. thing that I've really stuck at. So we 
Haven't had a television since. I do watch Netflix so on my computer sometimes. <laughs> but not every night. <laughs> I was just about to say, like, you've not watched this, but yeah, you know, you're not right. every day. Like, I just right. get home, put the radio on, I put some music on. I often don't have time to just sit but I just don't want and I know people like TV but that focal point my friend came around the other week and it was like where's your TV what do you put your furniture out <laughs> you just couldn't get his head around it so how do you relax then how do you oh no how do you get back to that feeling of freedom then what do you do in your spare time do you still climb no th- no so once I started when we came back home so that was f- the February 2017 then started my degree only nine months later so working full-time in the role I was doing and doing that I I just didn't have time to climb because when you go climbing you know you're gone eight nine hours Mm. on a Saturday especially if you're going outdoors you know at the time I was doing it was climbing three four times a week during the week then all weekend um, and trying to do my degree and work full-time I had to stop which is a shame really Jason my husband still does it Mm. could you pick it back up do you think could you jump back on I think so, just not yet. Just a clip and climb, just a clip and climb. Yeah, yeah, and I guess now my time filled with other things, but where I live um, is quite communal, so I feel like you get that communal feeling that you get when you're travelling. We're all uh, really close and, yeah, there's like WhatsApp group for the house and we all sit in the garden and talk and share things if we've got, you know, if someone's got something. Yeah, it's really nice. I, I get that from there a little bit. I'm from here now, right? Yeah, I'm so from here. Another community. Yeah. Sharers. Yeah. Awesome. So you you end up working with the schools on what what was that like? I imagine you encountered like a lot of kind of struggling kids there, right? Yeah. So I started with primary school kids, which is quite a change for me because I'd worked with like ten plus for quite a long time, and then mostly when I worked at the youth offending service, I worked with the most serious offenders in the city, so they were much older so then going to work with primary school was different but similar because they're just the same kids they're just Mm. younger so they're going through the same experiences the family's the same often sometimes I knew the families already what Um, what were like the main kind of struggles oh gosh um crowded living um no money no work poverty yeah yeah Drug, alcohol use, mental health problems, domestic violence, um, lots of child abuse, neglect. Uh, how do you, uh, what, how do you approach something like that when a kid's like really struggling because of different circumstances? I don't how, even know. Just yeah. kind of do it. Just, I mean, you can't change it really, can no. you? I mean, you can't just pick them up, take them home, I suppose, and no. move into the spare room. It's, it's challenging. Isn't I it? guess for me, I try to help remove some of those barriers. So. Um, you know, some of the kids, they don't come to school and tell people this, but if the mum's an alcoholic and they've got four or five siblings, they're the oldest one, they're pretty much the carer. So in addition to getting themselves to school and then getting told off because they've not got the tie on or they're wearing the wrong shoes, you know, they're trying to look after the siblings and making sure they're all getting fed. So sometimes I'd get to school on a Monday and the kids hadn't eaten since Friday and it's really heartbreaking and then they're getting told off for not wearing the right uniform or for being... 15 minutes late and yeah. you know that's really hard um how did I approach it I don't know try to remove some of the barriers so if they're overcrowded speak to housing try and get them somewhere else to live you know making sure they're getting food bank vouchers trying to help them with uniform um, imagine just no giving was, them some love I was going to say imagine yeah. no one's actually cared for them before so no. like so just someone saying do you know what talk to me and and, and stuff like that but that and that's great for them, but at the same time, for you, being an empathetic person, I imagine that's quite yeah. hard because you take on that pain and trauma because you, you do, don't you? Like yeah. humans do, just take it on. And so that must have been tough. Yeah, it was tough. It was hard, especially when I first started at the Youth Offending Service, to be boundaried. Like I was just available 24 7, and you know, because these kids didn't have anybody and I wanted to be consistent. I wanted to be that person that they could trust because that's what they're missing. Mm. Um, So, yeah, that was a big lesson in the beginning to not be... And you've just left that job to come work here. Yeah. And that must have been quite difficult to leave. Yeah, it was hard. And we spoke about this before. So, you you know, I imagine you you felt a little bit like you were leaving them behind, right? And you feel responsible for them, even though you're kind of not. Um, Tell us about that thought process then. Why... 
would you give up that kind of job to come work here? And that's no, no, not to blow smoke up our ass, but like, <laughs> it's a very different type of job, isn't it? It is very different, yeah. Because people will be thinking that. I mean, I thought it and I said to you, like, straight, like, you know, what, how is it going to feel not doing that job anymore and then doing this, which is very different? So, why have you decided to leave? Um, it's a hard question that I, I think, I guess I was just ready for a change. You know, I've done that job for 15 years working with those children, those families. And I guess you just start to sometimes think that's what the world's like, um, even though you know it's not. When you're exposed to that all the time, it takes its toll on your own health as yeah. well. Um, and yeah, maybe just wanted to see the, the nicer side of things and yeah. give what I give to those children, but in a different capacity and to the members as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we're wholly positive here, aren't we? I mean, that's the difference, isn't it? You get, obviously, some members require some support and we, we offer that. Um, where we can but ultimately we're trying to give people a great thing and change their lives for the better but they're coming at us from a fairly positive and engaging point of view so that should be yeah much better for you much easier. and I think all those skills you've learned you know I feel really kind of uh, enthused for our own members because I think yeah. they've got a fantastic community already mm. and we managed to give as much of ourselves as we can but actually it's going to be better and they're going to have even more support and they're going to have even more positivity with you in around. So they're very, very lucky to have you as their programme director. Thank you. And sorry, mate, no, you no, about you the, what I was going to say about, so you came back from climbing, you went to university. So why, why the nutritional therapy? What was it about that that was kind of drawing you in? I think I'd always been, or I'd started to become more interested in that as I got older and I could see um, my dad, for example, just not living a very healthy lifestyle, his partner being on loads of medication. And before I went traveling, I started to consider going into that career because um, just thinking there's got to be another way for people than just suppressing everything with pills and, you know, um, yeah. Because I think that's what we lived like, don't we? We take a pill, we want a quick quick kind of thing and that's how we've been taught to to deal with things so yeah went looked into dietetics and then stopped because I went traveling and then when I came back that's how I picked it up really I guess it's that part of me it's the caring side so I want to There's help a theme, people isn't underpinning this all that you're very much a people person yeah yeah yeah. To help people, yeah yeah that's exactly it right. and with that I'm helping people and that's what I want to do if I can help someone have a better life and a happier life, and that's good. And so there will be some of our members, I suppose, who could really benefit from a better um, way of fueling themselves and, and looking after themselves internally through food and stuff like that. So what kind of what do you offer? If you were to plug, tell us about your business, what, what, what would you be offering? And any members who want to get in touch with Sarah can do separately, but what, what would yeah. you Yeah, so nutritional therapy is... Um, I don't really know how to explain it now. <laughs> I feel like my brain's gone. Um, so I help people who have maybe got quite chronic illnesses that have got to a point in the NHS where they can't help them or the NHS isn't set up to help. So, for example, I might have people with chronic fatigue syndrome, ME, thyroid issues. I work with lots of female health, so menopause, PMS. Um, I've got lots of male clients also who maybe have low testosterone or work people with anxiety. Um, and... What we do that's different to, say, a dietitian or a nutritionist is um, they're kind of like a one-size-fits-all, whereas nutritional therapy is personalised medicine. So we look at the person individually and work out what's going on for them. So we go, like when I was studying my degree, you go really down like to cellular levels. So you're working out like the pathophysiology of something, so how that disease has manifested, where it started. Is it a nutrient deficiency? Is it... A genetic issue like have they got genetic SNPs have they got not got an enzyme that's right for breaking down a particular neurotransmitter so it's really really scientific mm. um but it's not just based on food so it's like a whole diet lifestyle program we look at stress look at sleep um so yeah I can take people's bloods and test the genetics test the hormone levels oh. poo samples can do all sorts of stuff hair mineral tests you, got all that, you can do all that at home? So? Not at home, yeah. I have to order the test and then oh, send okay. it off to the laboratory. You know what you're looking for when it comes back through? Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And um, so I get like a whole a whole panel. So there's, I can test um, like people's microbiome, so you know, all the gut bacteria to see how that's kind of oh, working. Wow. 
because a lot of your neurotransmitters are made in your gut. So if your gut's not healthy and happy, then... Is this something that people should do anyway, like just yeah, to see? Yeah. Or do you have to start like presenting with certain issues to to do this? No, not at all. So, yeah, that's what I was going to say. So I have some people that have got chronic health conditions and then I've just got people who just want to know how to live well and like live as long as possible and be healthy and happy and um, see it can be anyone really. And is it as simple as just eating vegetables and... No. I mean, it's not complicated, <laughs> but because um, it's so specific to somebody, like they might not need to do that. So when I meet with someone, we do a two-hour consultation, the first appointment, and we discuss right back from birth all the way through to today about their life, kind of what's gone on, any big life events, has there been any trauma that could have triggered the illness or feel it. Some people are just fatigued. They're like really tired and they don't know why and they just then think it's normal um, when it isn't. And then we um, would look at all the different body systems. So we treat the person holistically rather than if you've got a problem with hormones, you go see an endocrinologist or if you've got a brain issue, you go see a neurologist. We look at all the body systems and how they interact and then try to rebalance that. So I guess when you come to see me, you know, like when you go to the doctor and you see him and it's right, you're in and out. With me, you get that two hours of just talking about everything. Mm. So it's like a GP appointment, but extended. Wow. Now, do you ever have to prescribe someone like more Indian food? More Indian food, yeah, definitely. You need to more go pizza. to more town tandoori <laughs> seven days a week. <laughs> you want those diseases. You want those diseases. <laughs> Get to the agra. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but I am, as a nutritional therapist, I am allowed to prescribe particular supplements, high dose nutrients. I can look at doing like medicinal mushrooms, um, all sorts of different stuff. So. Is yeah. that like nootropics and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, nootropics, yeah, adaptogens. Because they're quite vogue, aren't they, and stuff? Yeah. Everyone's yeah. kind of like, well, there's more and more companies like selling nootropics for, to make you more kind of alert. And yeah, because on it focused. do it, don't they? They yeah. sell them and a few of us. Yeah, so yeah, but um, yes, I'm allowed to like... I'd like to talk to you more about that. Did I answer your question? I feel like I don't know if I just went off on a tangent. No, no, like, yeah, I totally did. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's great that people understand that, again, like... Obviously, we've talked to Johnny Gratian and he's got his thing that we're all doing at the minute. Yeah. So, I mean, we can literally sit here and talk about food. That's all we do. Talk about how tired we are and how much food we want to eat. Um, but it's great that members know that, again, I think from a community point of view, they've got access to someone with that kind of expertise. That's so important because there's bound to, in 350 members, there's bound to be someone or a handful of people or 20 people who are feeling like that and they've kind of been to me and they're not really sure what to do. Yeah. And maybe like a 12-week transformation in for them. Maybe actually it's a longer-term holistic view. That Then they've got yeah. someone they can turn to, right? And I think what we're creating here, and this is like really exciting, is almost like a community, almost like a community within the world, like within our own thing. So for instance, like Aaron Rafter, he's going to come and do a bit of tiling at my house. I know uh, Matt Barron is a heating engineer and he was going to do a little bit of work for Fruk. And then we've got my brother who's a plumber and then we've got maybe Tom O'Donnell who's a plasterer. All these people, we've got to leverage this better. So this, I think we spoke about this before as well. We're going to create and we're going to pledge to create at some point in the next 12 months a member directory of people's businesses who yeah. are members of our community where you can go direct to them they know you're part of GBRL's community and they will offer you either preferential rate or a quicker response time or, and you can trust them, right? Because they're part of our community. That's just so exciting. Yeah, it is really exciting. We're building something bigger than jiu-jitsu, right? And that's, yeah. that's the aim. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. To yeah. make the world a better place by doing what we do. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah I mean, I've already had a Chris round to my mum's house to fit a tap. I know. <laughs> <laughs> my brother's going to hate this because he hates doing jobs on the side. I'm not <laughs> pushed to get around to my house. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's great, man. And I guess like nutritional therapies, it's therapeutic. So there's lots of emotional support. It is like therapy. So it's not just looking at nutrition, I guess, which is what sure. you asked. It just came to my head then. Yeah, no, that's awesome. Um, yeah. So tell me about how you heard about and got into jiu-jitsu. So it kind of ties in with coming back from traveling and then not being able to climb. 
and my friend Sam, who's friends with Liam Cam, um, they started an event, Pantheon. Yep. Um, Sam the DJ, Sam. Sam the DJ, Sam, yes, Sam Townend. I used to train with him years ago, yeah. Yeah, so he's been my best friend since we were 13, so oh, cool. 24, 25 years, more. He's 14 in February, so long time, yeah, we went to high school together. Anyway, so went down to Pantheon to support him, um, watched some of the fights, and... I just felt really drawn to it. It really reminded me of climbing, like quite graceful movements, like a dance, just, and that like meditative state that you get into. And I thought, oh, that's what I need to do. I don't have time to climb at the minute. So that's what I'm going to get into. And then it took me a while, then went to the second event. We've then... been there at the same time, by the way. Really? I, I, was, I was cornering Lewis because he's fought on both yeah. those cards, yeah. So yeah. I was sat like in the corner when he was fighting. So did you go to the one at the warehouse? Oh, the stylist, to, both. Yeah, both, yeah. So the warehouse one was where Mark, how do you pronounce his surname? The or how do you pronounce it? Right, yeah. He was there, wasn't he? He yeah, was yeah, there. Yeah. But yeah, so I watched that and just really liked it and then was a little bit scared. And then I think we went into lockdown and then, yeah. So you guys did a free trial and that's it. So you saw us what, on Instagram or you saw us on... No, do you know? Because you could have gone train with Sam. Because he's still training, right? Yeah, he goes to... Um, Century's still there? No, Scramble. Scramble he yeah. goes to Scramble with Liam. Yeah, I don't know why. Do you know, my friend Tom, who comes here, Tom Slade, I'd seen he was doing some stuff with you and then Way, my friend, she came for a free trial and I was like, oh, yeah, I still want to do that. It just kind of all reminded me to do it. Yeah. Just yeah. Out, yeah, although I don't know, Way through CrossFit, we're separate from that. All right, um, cool. Yeah, we were friends there in another means, yeah. I dog sit for her dog, Barry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Barry the dog, shout out to Barry, Barry the, the cockapoo. <laughs> He's been in the academy, hasn't he? He's been he has, in. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, he came in for a little visit, didn't he? Oh, yeah, no, I think I remember that, actually. Do you yeah, remember? Yeah. He was yeah. very well behaved. You couldn't even tell well he was behaved, here. Bro. You can come back, Barry. You <laughs> yeah, you don't want my dog around here. We only have, we only have like, Kaiser, Sam Lal's dog. He's, like, a cool dog. He can definitely come in. <laughs> and Barry can come every now and again. <laughs> well, he can come in. What's your dog? Can... I have a dog? When you toilet train your dog, he can come in here. <laughs> Until then. Over <laughs> 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 Dashen. <laughs> you got to bring it in. I know, the kids will go crazy. Yeah. What's it called? Loki. Oh my goodness. <laughs> bring it to Warrington. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> I think we'll love that. <laughs> yeah. um, what were we going to say then? And so tell us about your jiu-jitsu journey then so far. So when did you join? Been with us like two, three months? Did I join in May, I think. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah. So how many is that? June, July, August, September, four months? Yeah. Um, How's it going? Yeah, it's all right. I'm enjoying it. I feel yeah, like I know I nothing. I didn't see you for a long time because you trained in the morning classes, right? Yeah, and that's still what I mostly do. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not an evening person. I think I just came in one time and Sarah just watering the watering the plants. Was it? <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh yeah, that's also part of my job role. <laughs> Crazy plant lady. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, you I... broke some back to life because there was some like definitely going. We killed most of them last winter. <laughs> Spent about a thousand quid at Daisy Chain and like just they all died. <laughs> Yeah, That's when you right. went on holiday, I took them all home, didn't I? Yeah, and revived some of them. Yeah. Thanks for that. Did some propagating. Yeah. So, yeah tell us about your first jiu-jitsu class. What was that like? Well, for like my free trial, mm. well, it was just me and, what, 20 odd men in that class. It was really busy. Was yeah. Um, but I really enjoyed it. Everyone was really welcoming. Um, obviously, I liked it because I came back. But, yeah, it's just, um, do you know what I like about it? Like, when I go to CrossFit, I do switch off. When I come here, like, I'm trying to remember the moves. I know I don't, but I am trying to remember the instructions. And I'm concentrating so hard that I just don't think about anything else. And I really like that. Yeah, you have to um, be very present. We spoke about this before, haven't we? Yeah. Like about getting recharged because there's nothing else you can think about. Yeah, I mean, you do... Sometimes you find it quite challenging to remember the steps of the technique. Yeah. Right? But... I think you're definitely getting better. And I think you just need to train more often. Because yeah. That's the problem if you only train twice a week, is your progression, it, you progress, but it's very kind of linear and it's quite a shallow curve. You, If you even one more class a week, you just see that curve just going straight up. Yeah. Once a week is a flat line, pretty much. Twice a week to very, very slow. But then three times a week, four or five, I mean, you're just going up like this. And it's because it's just consistency. Yeah. And that's the great thing about the Grace Barrow curriculum, right? Is that you, you're guaranteed to be able to attend another class exactly the same as the class you've been to, but only come twice a week, 
you were doing class A and class B once. Yeah. But if you came again, you'd do class A again. You've already done it. Yeah. So then you're halfway there already, right? And I think that's the next step for you right now you're in the business is to try and attend one more class a week. Yeah, because I do remember doing that one week and really liking how much it went in and being able yeah. to, to practice it like more than that once. I, I definitely felt the benefit of doing that that week. 100%. But yeah, I guess as a woman coming in first class, didn't know anybody at all. I felt, I, it just felt, I felt really, I don't know, comfortable and it was good, first class. What did uh, what did your friends and family think of your, well, one, starting jiu-jitsu and then two, taking the, the, the job here? Um, well, first one, everyone kind of not surprised because they just think that I'm that type of person that just goes and does whatever. <laughs> I'm like quite a, an adventurous person, I think. So like you like last summer in the middle of the pandemic, I just went traveling around Spain and Italy on my own. Met friends that I'd met previously, but yeah, just went off for six In the middle weeks. of the pandemic. Well, yeah, last July was... Do one, Boris, I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> you mean there's that lockdown year, shit, yeah. I'm going. So not July, just gone, yeah, the one before, oh, when it was all kind of... I just thought, well, if Ryanair is still flying, I'm going to go. And I was staying at friends' houses, so I felt like... You're going to kill that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but we were out rock climbing every day, boarding, surfing, you know, we weren't really in populated areas. So, yeah, I think some of my friends wasn't surprised, but also, like... What are you just going there with lots of men? Like, are you crazy? And thinking I'm going to get broken legs. But then some people don't know really what jujitsu is, I guess, yeah. as well. Um, like, is it like karate? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get punched in the face. I think my husband would rather I be climbing than doing this. But um, have you tried any techniques out on him yet? No, he won't let me. Yeah. Actually, I remember. That's why he's yeah. Yeah. We'd been here and we were practic- We were doing a move and because I was little, I remember having to just do something extra. So then the next week we went to Wales on holiday and every morning I was like, please just let me practice that move on you. Yeah, 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 later. Please just let me practice that move and I've still never done it to this day. Sure, he just won't let me. And just do it. You know? Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to. Oh my God. Against the resisting opponent. <laughs> yeah. I think it's great we've got loads of lady uh, and, and particularly girls as well members. I mean, we, I think it was the other week we have more women in the class than men yeah fridays time. friday nights can be like yeah. pretty dominant and female yeah. i mean that's, that's so incredible. awesome so again if you are a female or and that's pretty consistent most fridays right yeah that's the night to come down if you've like just joined or you think they're joining or you want to join then maybe come down on a friday for a free trial when there's loads of the ladies in and the community is super like nice and support. yeah there's even and it's not an official uh whatsapp group there's like a female (laughs) like ladies only group and that's brilliant isn't it you know what i mean that everyone's connecting and supporting each other yeah yeah because i guess people are creating friendships here as well which is great and the confidence that that's going to inspire in well two things the confidence it's going to give you to be able to come into an environment like this and then thrive which is one thing but also given the current kind of environment outside and the press and things that have happened recently just the ability to desensitize yourself as a woman to conflict with a man, yeah. physical conflict, is a potentially life-saving thing. Even if you don't do any jiu-jitsu in that moment, but you know that when they get hold of you, that's kind of like jiu-jitsu. And if I do this, then I'm kind of safe. And if I'm not, then I'm not. That could be a lifesaver, right? Yeah. Yeah, or even just the confidence to say no. Such a great thing. I yeah. mean, let's let's hope more and more ladies do join, because I'd really love that. Well, yeah, I think like even just for the future of jiu-jitsu, though, with how many kids you see, like, like the girls to uh, boys ratio in the little champions program. Mm. Obviously, it gets like the older you get, like, the kind of less it gets, right? It's yeah. like, you know, um, by about juniors and teens, it's more again male dominated. Yeah. But then, like, little champions won almost 50 50, so you know, sometimes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but maybe those guys, hopefully, those ladies, though, the girls will filter up and yeah. they'll stay in it. You know, some of those. Nine, ten year olds, because like last night, the Wednesday night, the little champions two, there's like what two spaces left in that class, and there were four, 40 kids, and I would say at least ten are girls. Oh, maybe like more. more than that, yeah, maybe fifteen, yeah. right? And so if they move up, that's awesome. Then we've got, and I think it's just a really, and the the great thing about that, I think, is that that's just going to be passed down then, perhaps when they go to uni, and then their friends, or then their children, and it's like just becomes. Like this unstoppable force. I mean, because we know how um, amazing Jiu Jitsu is to change people's lives for many different, across many different kind of markers. I think it's just going to hopefully make the world a better place, man. 
Very awesome. Cool. Um, Sarah, is there anything that I know, you, I know you wanted to get some social events and stuff planned? Is there anything else you, you're planning to do that you can let us know about? Yeah, I haven't asked, answered your second question. Evie, you said, what did my friends think about oh, yeah. coming here? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah. Do you want me to answer that? No, still, no, for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They all thought it was brilliant. I think they'd seen uh, like my health being really affected by my other job and I think sometimes you look back at things through rose tinted glasses, don't you? And I was like, oh, no, I do really love it. I want to keep doing it. And they all kept reminding me, like, no, do you remember when this happened? Or you remember when you're feeling like this, you know, when you get home and you can't even have a conversation because you're absolutely, like, exhausted emotionally. Um, so everyone who I've spoken to think, yeah, it's the best move I mean, I it's, have uh, done. it kind of says a lot about the person you are, but you haven't fully walked away because you are no. still volunteering. <laughs> Can't leave the kids, man, because you feel responsible for them, which yeah. is lovely. Yes, yeah, so I'm still volunteering every Monday uh, for half day before I come here, and then a little bit on a Friday as well. Let's talk about the events in a second, but oh, yeah. just, let's just pause on that and so explain to members kind of how it might feel slightly different now in terms of communication. So up to now, kind of Coach T obviously is the digital lead and runs all our um, digital presence online and tends to respond to most Instagram kind of messaging. I've been doing the program director role pretty much, which is all new leads, new sales and new members and all our membership comms, apart from the care stuff, which Soaps does. You will now be doing all that, right? So if you're messaging on the WhatsApp phone, hi, Professor Mike, you'll be speaking to Sarah as of Monday. If you're emailing in on the membership app, you're going to get Sarah. Um, and it's important people know that. In terms of, I've been like, available 24 seven to most people for, since we opened. Um, it might feel slightly different because Sarah's got her other job as well and working with us 22 hours a week-ish yeah. or whatever. So there'll be some times when that that call isn't answered for 24 hours. We're still there. If you desperately need to get in touch with us, you can always pop in or you can see me coach T, but just be mindful that you will get that service. It will be even better. It just won't be as open as it has been in terms of the door because it's been wide open and that's been starting to affect certainly my family life and your tiredness and health and I know we've been working to ourselves to death so I think it's a good it's a good move for everyone that you hear so what exciting things we've got going on what we've got coming up well well we've got the fireworks night on the 6th of November boom yeah so that should be really good have we sold all the tickets out yet I mean, I imagine we probably have to put him out. <laughs> I, think, I think so, from the uh, the messages, yeah. I mean, yeah. sure, I'll pick up one real quick, which put the message out, like there's only about 100 left. <laughs> so we responded to the Around Asian Rugby Club fireworks night, which again, as a, as a as a business, what I wanted to do to support our community, because that's so, so important to us. And a lot of our members trained on around Asians. Mark Moran is the manager of the under-11s team, and both his sons come here. My son plays in that team. So we some of the boys. So that's awesome. And um, and as a result, we were able to offer a family ticket price for three quid, which is nothing. There's no council fireworks on in mm. around this. So that is the biggest show in town. Leeds Delia down there with all their amazing pizzas and food, not, which none of us can eat, but you guys can. <laughs> um, and it's going to be a great night. And it's on the same day as the competition, right? Yeah. Down at uh, John Charles, so the Empire. So that's going to be a great thing. Are you going to have people meet outside here, do you think? Is yeah, that... I thought it might be nice if people wanted to. We could all meet here, like 6.15-ish, get some lollies for the kids, some sparklers, all walk down together, just so then we're all... And we're coaches. And we're coaches. Bring a glove, bring a glove. Health <laughs> <laughs> and safety. You, yeah, we're allowed sparklers. I'm having a sparkler. Oh, yeah. No lollies, though, for us. No. <laughs> <laughs> One bar for a toffee lolly, so we can have that. We'll that. And then we're going to open a Mosey Gang. Nations, 15 week QV program. <laughs> um, I talked to Luke Town the other day. Hey, Luke, shout out to Luke. He, was, he did Johnny's um, transformation. And he, he's been on it for like six months. <laughs> and like a few weekends away, just putting him back. And now he's reverse diet. It looks brilliant as well. I don't think I could do it for six months. No. No, I don't think it done. I think in two ways. You either like you go hard at it and you get it done in twelve, mm. or actually mentally it's actually a bit easier because you do have mini breaks, but then it just takes a bit longer. But mm. yeah. it depends what you want. And so yeah, maybe and you're gonna put some messaging out about meetup times where yeah. when 
that's going to be coming out on the WhatsApp channels. You put a post on Instagram, it's going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's up. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. And then what next? What's after that? Fourth uh, of December, is it? Fourth of December. Yeah. We have been open for three hundred and sixty-four days on that day. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just huge. Yeah. I mean, we, we we only open the doors for like an open day. And if just going back to that, do you remember like we opened, the, we put some balloons down the stairs, I opened the door and I remember thinking, I hope at least one person turns up. <laughs> and then oh literally God, I got yeah. pinned in there was, with just loads yeah. of people streaming oh, out. Amazing. I could not get out. It was non-stop, wasn't it? And we got set, like 75 founder members signed up and we were yeah. aiming for 20. Yeah. Which was, and then it's just gone crazy since then. So that's awesome. That is good. And See it. cake. Which again, we can't eat. I might be able to. Eat I can. That. I definitely can. <laughs> so basically, what we're going to do on that day is it's a Saturday. We won't be running classes as normal. We're going to have an adult seminar probably early afternoon, um, which either I will run or we'll have someone in to help to, to run that as a bit of a special seminar. There'll be some big promotions that day as well. Maybe some new belts, some folk who, who deserve it at that level. There'll be drinks and, and cake, and we'll sort all that stuff out. And then we'll do the same for the kids in the morning. And I think we're going to probably do, and we'll talk about this, but I would envisage we do two kids' sessions, get the tiny champs and the little champs together, and then the LC2s and junior teams together, just for an hour or so, have a bit of fun, hand out some new belts if they deserve them, and, um, and celebrate the community. Mm -hmm. Get some photos going and have fun. Man. Big party atmosphere. That's what mm -hmm. I want. Loads of music. Yeah. So... Uh... I guess my general point there was like there'll be more social stuff yeah. now happening, which would I'd, be good. I'd be keen to hear from people what type of social things they want. Like what? Yeah. So if anyone's got any ideas or anything, let me know. Well, Matt Lewis <laughs> said in the comp class, you know, he wants to go out to Lisbon on a like a team trip out to see Ooh, Professor yeah. Victor in yeah. Lisbon. So, I mean, I think ultimately, and I think we spoke about this again before. We'll keep saying stuff like this. Our aim is to make sure that our community of members is the best community across all market points in the UK. What, the, what that means to me is people don't leave. So they're in jiu-jitsu for the long term and they love being part of what we do. So ultimately what we'll end up doing is getting to a point where we're full and then we're going to close the doors. We will not be a business which continues to focus on new leads and growth because ultimately we'll just lose people out the back door. So Sarah's job initially is to um, ensure we hit the point we need to hit where we can do that. And then it'll turn back inwards and it'll all be about looking after our members. So expect even better customer service, even more of social events, even better engagement, even better care, even better culture, all for the same price. I mean, that's a great sales pitch. Come on, <laughs> what do you want? I'm great jujitsu. And we're trying to bring a decent band joke over from the US. <laughs> I'm sponsoring him hopefully to come over so it's, there's loads of great stuff happening man yeah man it's going to be uh, a crazy old time oh and I guess we need to speak about the gym 28th oh. of October how can we forget that well we just Correct. lumped all the stuff up so. yeah <laughs> <laughs> <Go see yourself. laughs> that's the first thing you'll have that's heavy I've lifted in about yeah. a long time <laughs> we walked past each other on the stairs we were like do we get extra calories for this yeah, do, well, like, let's get a takeaway for this <laughs> 10 kilogram weight of lifting. <laughs> so we've got Mural Minded, the guy who painted the amazing mural behind us, coming to do a little bit of work. Um, it won't be as extravagant as that, because we don't want it to be, but there will be um, a nod to Reorg inside there. Um, Beaverfit, who make the most amazing custom rigs who support the military. Uh, we've, we've commissioned a bespoke red, Gracie Barra red rig from them. Um, and a fold out rig as well. They're coming and fitting that next Friday, which means I've got to fit the floor before then. Um, and then the sauna's arriving next week. The ice bath, state of the art ice bath with cooling systems, is going to come in. Concept 2 Row arrives next week. And then Sarah will be in touch with everybody to offer that out to a select number of members. It'll be a premium membership. Um, we're just working on the price point. The one thing we want to ensure is that there's not so many members that you can't get in when you want to get in. So um, we're kind of working off the fact people probably want to train three times a week on top of their jiu-jitsu or twice. Um, so it'll be a select number of memberships. And once they're gone, they're gone. Again, just that's what we do. We, we create great things, 
people often to people and then when there's enough's enough that's it there's no more so i'd be if you want to train here at the gym and make the most of that rather than at some kind of like stinky big corporate gym somewhere um you need to be keeping your eyes peeled for that coming out pretty soon sweet anything else from anyone else no welcome to the team thank you welcome to the team we're very very fortunate to have you i know that um and i think our members are too and we just hope it you know you're here for a long time um because i think we can do great things as a team Amazing guy, too. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Group hug. Makes me, makes me happy, man. Makes me happy. All right. Till, uh, till next week when we have uh, Steve Dawson. Oh, big Damn. Steve Dawson's big in. Steve, yeah. He's got an interesting story. Yeah. Do you want to plug that a little bit? Little teaser. Little teaser. <laughs> little teaser. So a mental health matron, like senior nurse, turns brewer, master brewer, pub owner, turns... Pizza maker extraordinaire. <laughs> that is going to be a good well, point. Really got food in that we do. Me and Mum are interested in mine. <laughs> then the week after, I think I've got the big, the big. That's dog. the big. That's a yeah. big one. Yeah. Week yeah. after. All right. See you later, team. Us. <laughs>